Good morning. Before we get started today, as you turn to Luke chapter 12, I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to thank everyone for their love, their encouragement, and for their generosity. Um, Pastors Appreciation Month was quite remarkable. I'm just very humbled uh, to (laughs) praise the Lord. That became very evident uh, during this past month. So I want to thank you all so much uh, for your words of encouragement and for your uh, kindness, your generosity. It's greatly appreciated. I, I, I really don't know what to say other than thank you. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. We're going to be talking about the full. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, open up our hearts to understand. Open up our hearts to receive your word and to apply the truths of Scripture to our lives that we may glorify you. We pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The context of what we're looking at is always, always important. Anytime you open up scripture and you read something, you have to always take into consideration the immediate context of what's happening. So here, what I'm going to speak about is the context and the importance of the context. Jesus had been teaching. He had been teaching about the foolishness of worry. I know people like to worry. There are those people that have make an art, made an art form out of it. <laughs> Amen? Amen. And we worry about all kinds of things. But Jesus had emphasized the foolishness of worry in verses 6 and 7. He had given words of encouragement about not worrying. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are more value than many sparrows. And we would like to be prone to think that that should have been quite an encouragement for the people who were there listening to him that day. 
to know that God cares about the little sparrows in life and he cares much more about you and I. And something important to remember and we would think that'd be a time for rejoicing. But for at least one person in the crowd, one person, there's always got to be one at least. For at least one person in the crowd, the words of Jesus had little or no effect. He was worried about one thing. He had his mind on money. He had his mind on worldly possessions. He had his mind on getting his fair share of the family inheritance. He said, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. I want you to notice a couple things here. He didn't request, he commanded Christ. He commanded Christ. Now, there were times that we know of back in those days where people would seek out rabbis that would come along beside them and help uh, to settle disputes of different kinds, uh, to settle them according to the law. And it's quite possible, uh, given what's going on here, that this man may have just uh, considered Jesus to be just another rabbi, uh, it's likely, at least there's a good possibility, that this dispute over the inheritance had to do with the right of the firstborn. If anybody's familiar in those days about the right of the firstborn, uh, when the father would die in a family, the firstborn son would inherit a double portion over and above all others in the family. And that was that way so that that oldest son could take care of his younger siblings and his mother. So there was a purpose for the oldest son to receive a double portion. He had the responsibility of taking care of of providing for the family after the father was gone. But I want you to remember this as well as we speak about context. Jesus had been teaching many things of great spiritual value. He had been teaching about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He had been teaching the spiritual truth that one day everything that is hidden will be revealed, meaning that all hypocrisy will one day be revealed. He had taught that we must fear God, not man. We must confess Jesus before man, and we must never blaspheme the Holy Spirit of God because that's the unforgivable sin. Jesus had been teaching in these lessons, he had been teaching the importance of the condition of the heart. You got to see this. He'd been teaching the importance of the condition of the heart. And this person, it looks like he wants to divert attention away from these very important spiritual matters. But Jesus is the most awesome teacher there ever has been. And he's going to take this diversion, this diversionary tactic to get people off of the subject of the matters of the heart, spiritual matters, he wants to talk about these physical things, and Jesus is going to direct this conversation right back into the field of spiritual issues, because that's what he does. 
This man could only think about one thing. And Jesus is going to teach about the condition of the heart upon those who are greedy. Those who are greedy. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Here again, we see a direct warning. When he says beware, to understand the Greek for that word, it means to keep watch, be on guard, protect yourself. Against what? Against being covetous. A lot of people would probably say, well, that's not such a big deal. Yes, it is. It's a huge deal. Because people who are covetous have replaced God with material possessions. And that's what this is going to be all about. To understand the fullness of what it means to be covetous is to understand the Greek word pleonexia, which is translated covetousness. It means the desire to always want more. The desire to always want more. That means that covetousness is greed. And there are some who would say that being greedy is like drinking salt water in order to quench thirst. It doesn't work. Ecclesiastes 5.10 warns against the sin of greed in this way. And it's talking about the fact that greed the accumulation of worldly possessions will never satisfy a person's soul. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is vanity. Interesting. Greed is vanity. Now, to understand vanity properly, you have to ask yourself the question, how did vanity ever come to be? Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 20 tells us that vanity came to be because of sin. For the creation was made subject to vanity not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Now, to understand vanity, you have to understand what the Greek word means for vanity. It's metiodes, and it means worthlessness. Vanity is worthlessness worthlessness. So we have to ask ourselves the question, are we supposed to live in vanity or in hope? That's the right answer. <laughs> Thank you for that. I feel relieved. <laughs> you know, are we supposed to live in vanity or in hope? The creation was made subject to vanity not willingly, God subjected the world to vanity because of sin. But he also gave us hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. He gave us a way out of vanity. So we would say, are we to follow the world or are we to follow Jesus because this creation is subject to worthlessness. That's what vanity means. But you know what? 
God gives meaning and purpose to life. The world doesn't. Thirsting for more and more and more worldly possessions is vanity. Worldly possessions have no eternal value. Have you ever seen a funeral procession? with all the possessions following behind the hearse. Everything worldly stays here. When we're done with this body, everything worldly stays here. Nothing worldly has any eternal value. Worldly possessions are for this life and this life only. Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, there is a prohibition against coveting. And the prohibition against coveting, remember, coveting means greed. The prohibition against greed is because greed is idolatry. Greed replaces God with stuff. You know, there was a very well-known businessman in years ago. Someone asked him a question, said, how much money is enough money? And his response was just one more dollar. Just one more dollar. Jesus gives an underlying principle here. I hope you've seen it. Uh, An underlying principle that stands in the way of greed. You know, greed is uh, the result of sin. We have to recognize that. And Jesus says here, this uh, underlying principle that stands against greed. He says, A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. We either believe that or we don't. A man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And to emphasize this point, he's going to give a parable. Verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Now, a parable places one thought beside another for the purpose of illustrating a matter. And Jesus often taught with parables. And he teaches this parable, very important to get this, to an agrarian culture. They were living off the land. A lot of farmers. But I want you to understand too that the wealthy elite of the religious establishment of Judaism would understand this as well. Because it's quite likely that it's directed their way. Remember, Jesus has been challenging the Pharisees because they're false teachers. They are false leaders. They're the religious elite of Judaism. And he's been challenging them consistently all along. You know, what we see about this rich man, he was getting richer and richer. He was already wealthy. He already had more than what he knew what to do with, much more than what he needed. 
Notice it says the ground fought, brought forth plentifully. Uh, there's a word here for plentifully that I think is pretty important. Euphoria. Anybody ever heard of euphoria? Euphoria is the condition of the heart that rejoices rejoices in being filled with joy, being fulfilled, being happy, or having feelings of well-being. In other words, euphoria comes from a feeling of being successful. Ground brought forth plentifully. Here's the big issue. I want you to notice in this parable that Jesus gives, there's nothing said at all about this man becoming rich through dishonesty. Nothing. That means we can most likely assume that dishonesty wasn't involved at all in he gaining his wealth. And keep in mind that farmers can only do so much to ensure that they have a good harvest. God does that. This man had been blessed richly by God. God had blessed the work of his hands abundantly. He had much. God controls the harvest. God controls the weather. God controls the elements of nature that affect the crops. This man was rich because God had blessed him. Now, in, lieu, in view of the abundant resources he had, we would like to expect him to praise God for his abundance, but he doesn't. Instead, he says, I'll take it easy now. I'll sit back for years and years off the abundance of what I've accumulated in my life. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to rest. I'm going to take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. Have a good time. He thought nothing about God. He thought nothing about contributing to the needs of others. He thought nothing about using his vast resources to advance the kingdom of God through use of his material possessions. He thought not a thing about that. Nothing about giving to the poor, helping the infirm, giving to a good cause, or giving to the work of the kingdom. Nothing about helping those who couldn't help themselves. Nothing about helping the outcast, helping those less fortunate. He thought only of himself. Been richly blessed. But he had no concern for God. He had no concern for the things of God or the plight of man. He thought only of himself. He just wanted to lay back. Take it easy. Notice he thinks to himself. He didn't consult God in any of this. He devised a plan after his own heart. And he said in verse 18, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, 
Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Notice the condition of this man's heart. I want everybody to see where his focus is. He's prideful. He's arrogant. Just like Lucifer. Just like the devil. Notice this. I will pull down my barns. I will build greater barns. I will bestow my fruits, my goods. I will say to my soul, I have many goods. Laid up for many years. I will take my ease. I will eat, drink, and be merry. You know, Lucifer said the same thing. And this is so important. He overlooked the reality that everything he owned ultimately belongs to God, not him. Everything he owned belongs to God, not him. He, like all of us, was given a stewardship. All of creation is the work of God's hands, and God placed man to be managing what he has created. This is seen in Genesis 1, 28-30. God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over every little living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. God gave man dominion over everything he created. Man is accountable to God for that stewardship. Isaiah 50, I'm sorry, Psalm 50, verse 10 and 11. God says, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. God owns everything. We're just stewards. And we're going to be judged on how we manage what God has given into our care. Isaiah 55, 10, the rain and the snow come down from heaven and waters the earth and makes it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. God provides everything we need. Even for the wicked, Matthew 5, 45, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. He provides for believer and non-believer alike. Deuteronomy 8, 18. Whenever you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth, you shall remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Amen. For the rich man, everything was about him. Sounds a lot like Lucifer in Isaiah 14, verse 13 through 15. Satan said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. What does it mean to be a new creation? You know, greed comes naturally. Amen? Greed comes naturally. It's a, a part of the makeup of the natural person, the unredeemed person, the person who is not saved. The Apostle Paul writes about this, Romans 7, verse 7 and 8. I would not have known covetousness except the law had said, you shall not covet. People covet because God says not to. Coveting had been a problem for the Apostle Paul, amen? He just wrote it. But when he got saved, all that changed. He was a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. Behold, all things became new. Philippians 4, this is what he writes. You can tell he doesn't covet anymore. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You know, that doesn't mean he's content living in Ohio, Louisiana, or Arizona. Whatever state he's in is talking about his financial state. The state of his material holdings. For I have learned in whatever state I am in therewith to be content. I know how to be abased. That means doing without. And how to abound. That means having plenty. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. Notice this. This is many people's life verse. And I want you to notice the context that it's given in. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. All what things? Being content. Being content with much. Being content with little. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Jesus teaches, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The rich man had no concern for God. He had no concern for his fellow man. He had no concern for eternity. Just sit back, put up his feet, and admire his personal possessions. That was his desire. He never considered that he could use his vast resources to minister to the needs of other people. He could use his vast resources and give toward the kingdom of God. All he can think about is being set for life. Nothing to worry about. Just eat, drink, and be merry. You know, we've already read this. So you know how God responds. But just say for a moment, if you hadn't read this yet, how would you expect God would respond? Would you expect that God would give this guy a big attaboy? Pat him on the back and praise him for all of his worldly accomplishments? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Here's the distinction. 
That is exactly what the world would do. When somebody gets wealthy, especially if they're a self-made man, have you ever noticed the world flocks to them? The world heaps praise upon praise upon praise on those who do well for themselves financially. People think well of those people who do good for themselves. But God just doesn't think like the world thinks, does he? God says in Isaiah 55, verse 7 through 9, regarding the way people think, let the wicked forsake his way, and let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Get this. For my thoughts, this is God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. For as the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I I want you to take good note of what God says to the plans of this rich man. Thou fool. Called him a fool. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? What what, what does it mean to be a fool? In, In this context especially, Translates the Greek word ephron, and it means to be mindless. Literally, to have no spiritual understanding. And this man had none. He thought that success was having more. More and more and more. Without thinking of God without thinking of others, without considering his own eternal destiny. There were other fools in the Bible, by the way. The rich young ruler. Matthew 19, verse 16 through 23. He cherished wealth more than his eternal soul. And the Pharisees were fools. They also cherished wealth. Jesus teaches in Luke 16, verse 13 through 15, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, Mammon means wealth. Cannot serve God and wealth. Notice what's written here. And the Pharisees also, who were lovers of money, that means covetous, greedy. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourself before men. They weren't concerned about how they appeared before God. You are they which justify yourselves before men, for God knoweth your hearts. Here again, he's talking about the inner condition of the heart, not the outward appearance. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The world has high regard for the wealthy. The Pharisees were held in high regard. Mark 12, 40, 
reveals that the Pharisees devoured widows' houses. That means they took advantage of widows, those who were particularly vulnerable. They were greedy. First Peter 5, 2 tells the shepherds are supposed to feed the flock with a willing heart, not for dishonest gain. The Pharisees sought dishonest gain. Second Peter 2, 3, false teachers through covetousness, that means greed, and with feigned words, that means pretend words, words of hypocrisy. They will make merchandise of you. False teachers exploit people for monetary gain. Just check out the televangelists. First Timothy 6, 9 and 10. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish, harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. God says, thou fool. In Ephesians 5.17, Paul says, Wherefore be ye not unwise? That word is Ephron. It means don't be a fool. But understand what the will of the Lord is. A fool is one who does not understand what the will of the Lord is. Jesus used this word in Luke 11.40 when he condemned the Pharisees for being more concerned with the outside than the inside. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? Paul used the word in a passage of Scripture where he condemned the Corinthian church for their worldly wisdom. For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. The rich man was a fool for several different reasons. One, he thought he was in control of his life. He ignored the sovereignty of God. He had no concern for glorifying God. God had blessed the work of his hands. But God also held his life in his hands. Thou fool... This night thy soul shall be required of thee. The rich man had no fear of God. No concern for God's sovereignty. Somehow he operated under the delusion that he was in charge, that he was the master of his own destiny, the captain of his own soul, and I want you to notice, God says, your soul will be required of you this night. This night. What did the rich man say? I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to store all my earthly possessions. I'm going to take ease for many, many years. He didn't have many more years left. God said, this night... Your soul shall be required of you. Real important here. Psalm 39, verse 4 through 7. Lord, make me to know my end. 
And what is the measure of my days? That I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths. My age is nothing before you. Certainly, every man in his best state is but vapor. Surely, every man walks about like a shadow. Notice this. Surely they busy themselves in vain. He reaps up riches and doesn't know who will gather them in. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. Our hope is in God, not in stuff. Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only in labor and sorrow. Amen. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Psalm 103, verse 15 and 16. As for man, his days are like grass. As the flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over, and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. You know, Jesus asked the logical question. If you, he says, you're going to put up for many years. You're just going to sit back and take your ease, and you're going to eat, drink, and be merry. Have you ever thought what happens to all of those worldly possessions you gather? They're left behind. They don't go into the next life with you. And you don't know who is going to be using all of those things that you stored up. Most likely when Jesus said, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? He's most likely referring to what Solomon said. In Ecclesiastes 2, verse 18 and 19. Yea, I hated all my labor, which I have taken under the sun. Why? Because I should leave it unto the man that shall come after me. And who knows whether he shall be a wise man or a fool. Yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity, futility, worthlessness. You know, so we can lay up treasure in heaven and be rich toward God, or we can squander it from the flesh reap corruption. Jesus closes in verse 21. So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Matthew 6, 19, lay up not for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. John 2, 15, 1 John 2, 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Romans 12, 1 and 2. By the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable form of service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
so you may know that good and perfect will of God be a living sacrifice. I want to make something really clear here. The matter is not about possessions. It is about our attitude toward what we possess. It's about the condition and the attitude of the heart. We only have material possessions in this life. In the next life, you don't need them. Praise God. Nothing material has any value that lasts for eternity. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I'm going to beg you to. Abraham was very wealthy. Amen? Amen. So is Job. What about Solomon? Joseph of Arimathea. This is not condemning wealth. The question is, what do we do with what God has blessed us with? How do we manage it? Those things reveal the condition of our inner man. It's not about what you have. It's how you use it. Jesus is the remedy for greed. I don't know if you've put much thought into this, but he's the one who came to give abundant life. Amen? Amen. The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they may have life that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus gives the wealth that lasts for eternity. He's the author of the abundant life. You'll never find the abundant life in material possessions. With every head bowed and every eye closed. A person's life does not consist of what they possess. As we prepare for communion, this is a time for personal evaluation. Are you serving Jesus? Or are you serving money? Is Jesus the Lord of life? Or do you worship material possessions? Ask the following questions. Are you greedy? Or do you take joy in giving to those in need? Are you selfish? Or do you care about the good of others? Are you worldly? Or do you freely give to the cause of the kingdom of God? As we prepare for communion, there are a few things that I have to go over for anyone who will participate in communion. To participate in communion, you must be born again, first of all. Must be born again. Communion is remembering the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And there ought to be evidence of salvation. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 puts it this way. It says, repent and be converted. To repent, metanaos. Greek here is talking about to change your mind. In particular, to change your mind about the path you're traveling to change your mind about sin, to change your mind about God, to change your mind about righteousness, that is all 
a work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, verse 8 says, The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. In order to be saved, you must repent. Change your mind about sin, about God, and about eternity. To be converted, epistrepho, means to turn around and go the other way. Once repentance happens, there should be a turning of life. Turning away from hell, turning toward Jesus Christ in heaven. And that makes you a new creation. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. But he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eats and drinks damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This is a grave issue. We're going to take a moment for prayer. Evaluate your heart. Is Christ your Lord and Savior? Have you repented? Have you been converted? Father in heaven, during this time, I do pray. I pray, Lord, for those who are here and may not know you as Lord and Savior, that this would be the day of their salvation. In Christ's name, amen.